Good day, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to our technical summary video on the revised fee-related provisions of the IESBA code. There have been revisions, and this is a frequently asked questions document that has been issued by the IESBA staff. And we're going to be looking at it today because it is effective for years that start on or after 15 December 2022, which is now. All right, so the first December year end will be December 2023, and the first Feb one will be Feb 2024. It is relevant, very important to both non pies and pies, so that's public interest entities. As always, you can see I'm Letty Janssen van Vieren, and I look forward to taking you through a short summary of this very interesting topic. Right, let's have a look at the contents of what this video is all about. Very briefly, we're going to look at why this is important, first of all. Then we're going to look at an introduction and the contents of the publication. There you'll see I've given you a little screenshot of what it looks like. And we're going to go through an overview and summary, and then I will conclude on the topic. Let me just quickly show you what the entire document looks like. I think it always helps if you can just... Um, visualize that. So this is the document that we are talking about today. You'll see the full name, Refi uh, Revised Fee-Related Provisions of the Code, Guidance for PAPS, a Professional Accountant in Public Practice. Okay, so as you can see, there are loads and loads of questions in there. Those are the, the sections. The table of contents, I've redone that for you so that you can see, but there are loads and the questions you'll see, there's a question and an answer, and it's very, very nicely set out. 16 pages, and that's um, they really do discuss the practical issues around this topic. All right. Obviously, we're going to start off with a why it's important slide, but before we get to that, let's quickly just look at the abbreviations that, I, that I've used on my slides. IESBA is the International Ethics Standards Board for Accountants. They are a board of IFAC. IFAC has the two legs being IESBA and the IAASB. So whenever I talk about the code today, I'm talking about the IESBA International Code of Ethics for Professional Accountants, and that includes the international independent standards. And of course, if we're talking about fee-related provisions, we are talking about this, this threat to, you know, to our independence that it might create, and that's what we're focusing on. A PI is a public interest entity, FAQ, frequently asked questions, and Q&A, questions and answers. All right, so if you see that on, on any slides, you'll know what I mean there. Why is this important to us? Well, as accountants and auditors, we've got to adhere to the IESPA Code of Conduct. Remember, if you're a member, you're a professional member of, or a member of a professional body, your professional body has adopted the IESPA Code. I'm a member of SICA. SICA adopted the IESBA Code of Conduct. Uber adopted the IESBA Code of Conduct. So did CYBA, so did SIPA, uh, CIBA, all of them. All right. SIPA, CIMA, ACCA, everybody adopts the International Ethics um, Code of Conduct. Right. So this publication really gives us some clarity on the, the recently revised IESBA code, and it helps us to properly apply our ethical principles. When we talk about our ethical principles, we're talking about our fundamental principles, and the most important one there being independence. Obviously, there's objectivity and all of those, but you've got to identify your threats, and we have been through, through that ethics and how you actually go through the identification of the threats before. I have done a separate TSV on that for you, so you're more than welcome to refer to that one. But these FAQs would specifically provide guidance for PAPS, and that's public accountants in public practice, because when we have when we have independence issues, we are mainly talking about auditing and in and reviews, auditing and independent reviews, because that's we have, we have to be independent there, and therefore section 4A of the code becomes very, very important. So, the IESBA final standard, or the, what they call the final pronouncement, was issued in April 2021. They had comments, periods, due and everything. 
uh, everybody was all up in arms about it. But it does address a number of topics, and it includes things like threats to independence, which is our main one, created by fees paid by an audit client, number one, and that includes fees for services other than an audit. So fees other than an audit is definitely um, things like tax and company secretarial and compilations and all sorts, okay? We well, you know where, we, with what those are. So um, we're also looking at fee dependency because all of these create a threat to our independence. And the transparency of fee-related information to those charged with governance. Remember, if you've got uh, an audit committee that you report to, they are the ones that have to approve your audit fee. So you've literally got to go through your, your engagement letter with them in detail, and there's got to be transparency of exactly what you'll be charging for and what will be included in there. All right. And also, if you are, are um, reporting to the public from an auditor independence perspective, that specifically is in the case of public interest entities. We only we always think that, oh, when we're dealing with the public, yes, we're only worried about public interest entities. And to a certain extent, you are correct. But even for your non-PIs, you still need to go and have a look at your threats to your independence. The full fee pronouncement you can find by clicking on this link. Right. And like I've said before, it is effective for audits of financial statements for periods beginning on or after 15 December 2022. The publication contains guidance, okay, for PAPS. It is 16 pages in total, 33 FAQs. So those 33 FAQs all have very, very detailed answers, right? It was issued by the IESBA staff in January last year, and it is now they, they are referring back to this whenever they have, I see a lot of issues um, in, the, in the IESBA news that come through, and they refer people back to the staff uh, publication that the IESBA staff compiled. So it really is looking at highlighting, illustrating, or explaining aspects of the revised fee-related provisions in the code to help that we properly apply them. So it is going to complement the basis for conclusions for the final standard, yes, and it'll help national standard setters, uh, professional accountancy organizations, and PAPs, including firms, right, as we have to go through and adopt and implement these new provisions. The publication is also there to assist regulators and audit um, oversight bodies like ERBA, right, the corporate governance community, investors, preparers, everybody, all of the other stakeholders who need to understand this revised standard and how it is applied. So if we do a full webinar, we would look at this in a little bit more detail. But for now, let's summarize the most important aspects on this. These are the questions that you can find. The Q&A is the first section says Q&A is relevant to both non-PIs and PIs. Now, remember your definition of PI and non-PI. I also did a separate TSV on that one because Urbas was changed now. It was revised in 2019, and um, they actually just brought out the new definitions now. I think it was in December that they brought out the new document on that. So you're more than welcome to go and have a look at that TSV because, first of all, you've got to decide, is your client a PI or a non-PI? And the definitions have definitely been revised there as well. So you've got to go through and decide whether or not your client is a PI or a non-PI, and then you'll know which of these folk, which ones to focus on. So if it's a PI or a non-PI, there's a general section that applies to everybody. Right, so if it's a pie, then you'll have to focus on everything. But only non-pies have to focus up to question 16. From question 17 to 33, those are only for pies. So the first two questions are general issues. Question three to six are for threats that, are, that have been created by fees paid by an audit client. Now remember, it can be an audit client and they can pay different kinds of fees. It doesn't say audit fees, okay? It is fees paid by an audit client. So it could be fees for other than the audit of the financial statements. And then the proportion of fees, um, the, the whole proportion of the fees that you receive, if this one client of yours comprises 15% or 20%, whatever your quality control procedures decide is too much because normally it would be a significant one if it's like 10 or 15%. 
I think most people in the past have stuck to 15%, most of the partners. And they would then say, well, you know what, because I've got this one client and they comprise 15% of my total fees, I have a definite independence issue with them, right? Because I'm, I'm too scared to lose them because they're the majority of, of our audit fees. So, so there are questions 7 to 10 dealing with the proportion of fees. Question 11 deals with fee dependency. And this is now where you are dependent on those fees. That's from question 11 to 15. Sorry, I left that out. It's 11 to 15. And then other matters, just very briefly, uh, question 16. They also look at things like who can, who can perform post-issuance and uh, pre-issuance reviews. So who can ref who can perform a hot review? In other words, the in the EQR, and that'll be in terms of our new international quality management standards. And who can perform the post monitoring reviews? And there you would you would want somebody who's got the necessary expertise in in auditing and accounting. All right, but I don't think they have to be registered with ERBA as such in South Africa. Q&As that relate to pies only, and these are very specific examples that they've used here. Question 70 to 20 is all about fee dependency, and then the enhanced transparency with respect to the audit clients with the communication to those charged with governance, like your directors or audit committees, and then the public disclosure as well. Right, so the questions are all there, and you'll see they've actually set it out very nicely. So in an overview, section 410 in our code refers in various places to audit fees, and then it's got fee for the audit of the financial statements. Now, please note that these are not the same. Fee for audit of the financial statements is just for the audit of the financial statements. It doesn't, doesn't include any fee for an audit of a special purpose financials or a review of financials or anything else. So I know we tend to always say audit fees, but we, then we actually mean the audit of the financial statements, the general purpose framework. Right. So if you if you need to audit a special purpose financial statements framework, that doesn't is not included in fee for the audit of financial statements. So that's something that I had to wrap my mind around when I read the code. I've got to make a distinction between these two definitions. Pages three and four contain a table, and this is very valuable. It explains how various factors can impact on your threats and how you evaluate the level of threat that is created by fees paid by an audit client. Not just audit fees, but fees paid by an audit client. So I think let me stop there and quickly take you to pages three and four. Here we go. You'll see, for instance, it says here, um, the level of the fees and the extent to which they have regard to the resources required, taking into account the firm's commercial and market priorities. All right, so it says here, a firm might, might decide to charge a lower fee for a particular engagement in an effort to establish or grow share in a new market. If in setting that fee, the firm gives insufficient regard to the resources necessary, that might increase the level of threat, meaning you are undercutting just to get your foot in the door. And based on that, how really independent are you? Because if you're willing to, to go that far and lower your fees for whichever services you provide to this audit client, what are the odds of you expressing an, a qualified opinion? And therefore your, your independence will be threatened. So all of these factors here may lead, not does lead, may lead, right, to a threat to your independence. And there's your impact on the level of your threats, and then they, they refer you to other sections as well. But remember, whenever you've got a threat, you've got to go and evaluate the threat, implement the necessary safeguards, going back and see, is this now at an acceptably low level? If not, well, go back and change your engagement, or you'll have to leave the engagement all in all. all right. So those two tables I find very, very useful there. Where the, where, um, where the questions refer to, EQ, to EQRs, make sure that you also remember to refer to our ERBA code, all right? Remember in our ERBA code, this is defined and the quality management standards are already in, in effect. Same date as this one from the 15th of December, 2022. 
So we already have to have that in place. In the old days, you could have EQ, EQ, and I think we call them EQCRs, right? Engagement Quality Control Reviewers. Now the engagement quality reviewers have to be a member of Urba. So they've got to be. This will help you to determine who would then qualify to perform a pre-issuance review. Definitely has to be Urba because that's a hot review. It's before you issue your audit report. And that's your traditional EQR review. And a post-issuance review would normally be in, in line with a monitoring review. Okay. So that's what you would have to have then in accordance with those paragraphs. Always remember to identify your threats and implement the relevant safeguards. Very important. There's your source document with a, with a screenshot and the link. So this document I find very important. PAPs have to consider the threats to independence that are created by fees paid by an audit client, including fees for services other than audit. We have to focus on fee dependency. We've got to consider that. And we've got to consider the transparency of fee-related information that we communicate to the public or to those charged with governance. And remember that there are definite considerations for non-PIs as well. It's not just your PIs. And then lastly, Always, always, always document your considerations. Okay. If you still need more detail, remember we've got our monthly newsletter, our technical alerts, where you can follow us on LinkedIn. We've got our webinars on demand where you can go back and order recordings. There's a wide variety of those. There are live webinars as well. And then we've got the MCLU subscription, which is our monthly compliance and legislation update. Worth its weight in gold and very, very cheap. Right. So I trust that you are now a little bit more up to speed on this topic of the new fee-related provisions of the code. And I want to say to you, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.